Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which digs a little deeper into the minds behind the best of the food books through four food moments. And this week I'm with the winner of Channel 4's Great Cookbook Challenge with Jamie Oliver, Dominique Wolf. She's a publisher's dream. A busy mum juggling three young kids in the kitchen and cross-platform ideas sizzling away on every burner. A Thai mum, an auntie, whizzing up sauces that really do transform every dish and a new book packed with super easy pan-Asian cook hacks. We've often been talking about my USP and my food business, so I was able to put that thinking hat on. And I remember some conversations I'd had with friends who said, oh, we love Asian food, we love Thai food, but we really don't know where to start. So I started sort of working out how I could frame that in a way. It, it, it was obvious, you know, this is a solution for people who love Asian-inspired food, but they don't have the time or they don't know where to start. This is a woman to watch you mark my words. She'll have her own TV show before you can even say Saturday Kitchen. I asked her how it felt to win a book deal with Jamie Oliver's publisher. I have thought about writing a book for years and years and just to sort of, I guess, have so much enthusiasm about my concept um, was was amazing. And it's a really proud moment. And actually, you know, it's a tangible thing, isn't it? Having a cookbook out on the shelves. Um, and literally, I think I'm going to have it in my hand in about three, two or three weeks. So very, very excited about that. It is absolutely about validation, though. I mean, I do talk to a lot of content creators and cooks and chefs and writers across the board. And it's a very solitary job, isn't oh, it? I mean, yeah. you know, I mean, everybody's been watching you on the, the, the Jamie Oliver show, of course, the great cookbook challenge. But actually, that's not the reality of it at all. Take us through a typical day of somebody like you creating recipes. Oh, goodness. It's really it's it can be quite intense. And I think for me, the process of writing this book was, um, yeah, it was it was quite crazy because we had a very tough deadline. So I would literally um, set myself an agenda. This is what I need to do. I need to test five or six recipes a day. So I gave myself quite a hard target. Um, I worked, this sounds bizarre, but I even for this book, I worked from a spreadsheet. <laughs> um, I normally don't like spreadsheets in the slightest, but I thought, how on earth am I going to put my ideas down so I can understand this? So I created a Google Sheet a spreadsheet that I could then access on my phone. Um, and that was, a brilliant for me, a brilliant way of working. And I put them by columns. I colour-coded them. Um, and I, cre- you know, literally would work on, on creating recipes that I had ideas for. I researched a lot. Um, and then I would sort of allocate time. Right, I'm going to be in the kitchen now. And I've got three young kids. So I sort of had to do it when they were at school. So I had this window of opportunity um, and literally just had to be super organised and have this agenda, basically. Otherwise, it would be so easy for it to drift. So in a way, I'm the sort of person who actually likes targets and deadlines um, because I think an idea can just sit there for ages if you don't have it. Oh, one day I'll clean out the shed, you know, (laughs) for example. And that's five years later. Still, It it really is like that. Yeah, it literally is. When my kids were young... the mothers and I at the school gate, and it was always the mothers, we would c- talk about the amazing projects that yeah. we were, you know, about to do in that window, right, 9.15 to yes, 2.45, yeah, yeah. you know, go, 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 go. You know? It's exactly. It was really quite extraordinary. I mean, you do come over uh, in the show as incredibly driven, organised and motivated. Um, you know, I, I watched episode seven, the final, yeah. uh, with lovely Ian, the skint roofer, and lovely Rex, the Filipino. Yeah. I mean, either of them could have, have won that prize. I mean, both of them were excellent yes. concepts, weren't they? Yeah, absolutely. And they were, you know what, it, it was, it could have been anyone and they are, they are amazing. I'm in contact with them. And yeah, I mean, they, I, I actually thought, wow, they've both got brilliant concepts, you know. Well, they get to mark. I presume a publisher will pick them up. Quite potentially. I think, um, you know, I'm actually quite new to this in a way, although I've wanted to do this for a long time. So I'm still learning and understanding what it is that makes a successful book or a concept that people are interested in. Um, Part of it is the... I suppose it's that accessibility, isn't it? Um, And I think with this show in particular, you know, Louise was looking for a commercial book. Ultimately, that's what they want. They want a book that's going to sell. And I think it's just, you know, about the concept. How, how, what is the concept going to be that that the most people are going to want to pick up and buy ultimately? Um, They all, they could, everyone could, you know, I think everyone in that final six could sell a book without a doubt. Yeah. And it was really fascinating, actually, watching uh, that dinner with Alan Jenkins from Observer Food Monthly and somebody yeah. from TikTok and somebody from Tesco's. You know, they were joining Georgie and Jim and Louise, the judges, uh, in really kind of imagining what this book 
the winning book would look like mm-hmm. out in the world. And Rex's idea was, you know, curiously Filipino, as he wanted to call it, uh, was much more of a sort of a backstory about an unknown mm-hmm. cuisine, yes. which Alan Jenkins would always love. Yes. You know, where yeah. everybody, the Guardian and the Observer is always looking yes. for the next yeah. big thing in cuisine. But Ian's, the, the skint roofer, was an absolute supermarket yes. sell, wasn't yeah. it? Yours won possibly because it had a mix of both. It has story, yeah. it has identity, it has backstory. That's what everyone wants to be able to write about. I mean, people like me, yes. you know, when I'm doing a story on a show, I want to know m- more about the, the story behind it. I'm not going to sit around and talk about soy sauce noodles. Forever, <laughs> yeah. um, although we are going to talk a little bit about soy sauce noodles. But yeah. only in context of your your a Thai auntie dang. Um, that's what interests yeah. me. But you were really drilling down to your USP. For you, what was that about? Well, you know, when I started, um, I guess, on the first episode or the first challenge, I knew it was simple, you know, easy, delicious, Asian-inspired food. And it was always going to be the same food. But as the show went on, I started, and Louise did question, what's your USP? What's your USP? And I, I then sort of I've got a food business and actually I've often been talking about my USP and my food business. So I was able to put that thinking hat on. Um, and I remember some conversations I'd had with friends who said, oh, we love Asian food, we love Thai food, but we really don't know where to start. And I thought, gosh, you know, every day I'm making myself a really quick noodle dish or a quick curry and it's not complicated. It doesn't have to be hard. So I started sort of working out how I could sort of frame that in a way and actually it it was obvious you know this is a solution for people who love Asian inspired food but they don't have the time or they don't know where to start and it was just about literally putting it in that context that made all the difference I think Um, because it is there's nothing you know when my friends tell me that they are in a food rut and they cook four dishes on rotation or they order loads of um, those food box meals I think wow you don't have to do that there's so much you can do with just store cupboard ingredients um, so I think that's what it was just being able to articulate that as a solution and an, as a sort of here, is the, here are the people that, I'm, that would be interested in it and here is the solution yeah, absolutely. And that came over really, really clearly. The other thing that came over really clearly was when you said, it's me on a plate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and I know that, you know, publishers want to get a snapshot of Britain now, don't they? And you are perfect. You're a mixed race, you know, half Thai, half, well, you've got all sorts of parentage, haven't you? You've got a Dutch grandmother coming into one of your food moments. But, you know, you, you represent what Britain is all about You and you're bringing your culinary heritage, yeah. which is a mix. Yeah. And your interests. So, and you're a mom. you're a busy mom. So, the combination of all that is you on a plate, which will speak to a lot of young mums who want really interesting food for their kids really quickly. Yes, exactly. And you know what? I, I, just because I'm busy and I'm tired, I still want really tasty food. And that's what it boils down to. It's something I'm really, really passionate about. Um, you know, that's for me having, I've got to have had a difficult bedtime with the kids, but I come down and I've got some, you know, an excitement to look forward to. Um, we, uh, we have family meals at the weekend, but you know, and I think maybe when you've got younger kids, you perhaps feed them separately and you have your dinner afterwards. A lot of people do, may do that. And then it's just about, OK, I've only got 20 minutes, but I want something really tasty. Um, and I'm also passionate about cooking from scratch. And, and when I say that, I don't mean, you know, I mean, you can use a green curry paste. Absolutely. You can use your sweet chilli sauce or your hoisin sauce, but it's about cooking it. You know, um, I, I never get a takeaway very, very rarely because I know that I can cook something even tastier in half yeah. the time that's healthier. Um, and once you know, have some of those, you know, a few tools and a few of in- these ingredients, anyone can do it. And I wonder if that's why the title changed from Simply. Was it Simply Dominique? It, w- w- there was a working title of Simply Dominique, actually. Um, there was a, I think that was the sort of one for quite a while when we were in, um, when we were shooting the, the photos uh, for the for the cookbook. Um, and it changed at the last minute. And actually, I'm really, really happy with that because I think it really, you know, it really fits. Well, it's much more about who you are and that picture of your busy life. Yeah. I mean, you know, Dominique's kitchen is about three kids running yeah. around <laughs> and Dominique in the middle of it picking up something gorgeous very quickly. Definitely. Um, but you know, be- probably with a whole load of mates hanging around. And we're just going to come and join you for a glass of wine at the end of the day yeah, while oh, the yeah. kids get on with the play date. I mean, is that it? Is that what it looks like? You're <laughs> oh, God. When the kids are here, it, I mean, I can't emphasise enough how noisy my house is. They are particular screamers, my kids. So, yeah, it's a very um, busy kitchen. Um, how was Jamie? Um, he, I mean, I've met him a, f- a few times and he genuinely is. Actually, he's much more 
than the real deal, isn't he? He's much more than uh, than what comes over on television. Tell us the scenes behind the making of the programme where he was particularly helpful. I mean, we shot it at his his HQ and I have to say, this is a wonderful place. Uh, You know, I live really close, which is, which was brilliant. It really, um, I live in the next postcode, basically. Uh, So, I mean, the commute to work when I was doing the show, well, when I was doing the the shooting for the cookbook was amazing. So he's got this wonderful um, HQ and he has just got the most charisma I've, you know, I've seen in someone. He just walks into a room and you know he's there. He is full of energy, enthusiasm. He's so passionate. And from an entrepreneur's perspective, he's you know, the ultimate entrepreneur um, and something that I absolutely aspire to. You know, if I could have a fraction of his career, it would be incredible. Um, And he was there. He was so sort of willing to share advice, you know. Um, You know, we didn't get hours and hours with him. But when we were sort of in the middle of shooting scenes, he would come over to each of us and and talk to us and find out how we were doing. And we'd ask him questions. You know, I'd sort of try and ask what I could in that moment because, you know, you've only got a few moments to to uh, to to speak to him. Um, And yeah, no, he he was really great, and he he's been so supportive over this whole process. Um, he came in a couple of times when I was, um, you know, shooting the the cookbook, and and was just yeah, really lovely and just very genuine. Yeah, he really is that man. You know, talking about marketing and USP, you know, those are very sort of industry words, aren't they? They're designed to sell. Yeah. I know that you've listened to the Fortnum and Mason shortlist special yeah. on cooking the books. Did you hear something else when you were listening to your peers now, uh, Mark Diacono, uh, Tara Wigley and Georgie Hayden, who was one of the judges, yep. of course, on the cookbook challenge? Did they say something different? Oh, it was really interesting because the array of books they were judging, they weren't just pure recipe books per se. Uh, there were books that had uh, that were much more sort of entrenched in story and, and people and places. And I think that was something that really appealed to Mark. There were so many different factors. So some books were, were about that simplicity and accessibility. But actually, it appeared that some of the books that they loved were because they were really unusual concept, just done really, really well, something they'd never come across. Or, uh, I mean, they were talking about the, the Med book, for example, it's familiar, but done really, really well. So I, mm. I don't think there's just one type of USP. It, it really depends. You, you know, it's about the right thing at the right time in a way, whether it's simplicity, whether it's demystifying cuisines like Sambal Shiok, which is a beautiful book. You know, I've seen it and that's on my birthday list <laughs> this year. Um, and it's about the voice. I think that was something actually that really struck me um, about the voice of a writer. And I think that's probably something that regardless of what category it is saying would be very important for for the Fortnum and Mason Awards particularly. Yeah, and that's what Alan Jenkins picked up on yours. He said, "I get your voice." Yeah, it, and and I have to say that's the first thing that I picked up when I when I read it. It has a confidence about it, a fun and a kind of a zinginess about yeah. it. It, it. You can tell that you're talking to us. Um, let's start to go through some of your food moments. Yeah, um, we are going to talk about soy sauce, <laughs> um, but it's your auntie, your Thai auntie Dang, and this is where a lot of your ideas come from. Obviously, your mum on the show was a great inspiration to you. But tell us about Auntie Dang. Yes. Oh, she a uh, very vibrant character. She was the, you know, kind of the cook in the family in the sense that she ran a pop-up in a pub, um, pop-up Thai restaurant. And actually, I'd never had soy sauce noodles, Pedsy Yu, um, until um, my uh, eldest son was a baby. So he, about seven, no, nearly eight years ago, she, my auntie would come over. I was so lucky. I can't believe this. Uh, sleep deprived new parents. And she would come over and make us food. I mean, God, how lucky was that? Um, I mean, really, it was just incredible. And these, you know, like restaurant quality, obviously. Um, and one of the favourite dishes was these soy sauce noodles, this padsi ew. And she used to make this, um, she used to call it magic sauce. I'm going to make magic sauce. Um, and she'd uh, whip up like a huge saucepan, a vat of literally, I think it was soy sauce, oyster sauce and sugar, um, and boil it down to a, to a syrup. And she'd keep it in a large kilner jar on the side of our kitchen. And then often um, would use it for stir fries but in particular this padsi yu this soy sauce noodles um, and it's flat rice noodles stir fried with sort of often beef or chicken and some veg and I'd never had it before but bizarrely enough I'd always had pad thai and these were great you know and once you know how to make it they are really simple and that's a great you know it's, it's a dish I sort of often go to when I don't know what else to make I always have a stash of rice noodles you know I buy, I buy them in bulk <laughs> um, so you know and, and you can I, I kind of mix it up you don't have to do it to the exact 
protein or meat, whatever that she used, and I use whatever veg I have, but the essence is still the same. So I have her to thank for, for that simple recipe. Yeah, it fits very nicely into the time poor narrative of which I am not a fan. Um, I think that it's a, it's a narrative that's designed to make us buy things yeah. and, and to, to make us feel shortchanged all the time. But actually what it does deliver a cook hacks. And this is one of yes. those. Um, I, I did your soy sesame oil, chili flakes, sugar and rice vinegar dressing for my kale. How was that? <laughs> Absolutely amazing. You know, and I'll keep that in the fridge and I'll probably, you know, chuck it on some chard at, at lunchtime as well. Yeah. Um, and it'll be absolutely delicious. It'll completely, you know, change the whole spirit of my homegrown mm-hmm. Sussex chard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but that that kind of cook hack, how much pressure did you have to from Louise, for example? Because, you know, Michael Joseph publishes Jamie Oliver and he's all about five ingredients, <laughs> 15 minute meals. You know, it's all about cook hacks and it's about time, the time poor narrative. Did Louise talk to you about creating something for busy mums? You know, that that thing. Um I, it's funny because actually, Jamie, when I was thinking of before I knew he was going to present the show, I was thinking that he's probably my biggest influence because of the simplicity of his recipe. So actually, that was quite uh, funny that, you know, he ended up being the, the presenter, if you like. But there was never pressure as such. I think it's because these are the recipes I do. Um, I, I literally don't have time for complicated food. You know, even at the weekend, the idea of actually making my own pastry even would be like, this is a big deal. I'm making pastry. Um, that's not what I cook when I'm entertaining. I, I always go for simple. So these are just naturally the kinds of foods I cook. And, um, and obviously, you know, being a busy mum, it's not just about, and I think I said this, it's not just about being a busy mum. It's a busy person. And I think a lot of us are busy people. So I think... You know, hopefully my dishes speak to, to everyone who is busy, not just the, the parents among us. But um, yeah, these are just this is just how I cook because I'm not I, I won't say lazy because I'm not lazy. But, uh, you know, I get tired at the end of the day and I don't have the time or energy, but I really want to eat something nice. So, yeah. Yeah, I'm, it's interesting because I'm doing a Leith's online cookery oh, course at the amazing. moment. Oh, amazing. literally just started and we are literally learning how to cook eggs. I mean, it's that yeah, basic. Yeah. Oh, yes, but I remember. You did Leith's, did you? I did. I did it, um, an in-person part-time course of the essential certificate. Which is the one that I'm yeah. doing. So you'll yeah. remember the omelette, for example, the cigar-shaped omelette. Yes, and I actually did, um, I didn't do so well in that one because I put <laughs> too much salt in it. And they marked me down and I, I, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I thought... I could cook and now I've got a three out of five on my omelette <laughs> well uh, you know I put too much butter I, oh. I, I thought oh I know what 10 grams of butter is you know oh, God. Like, no no I didn't you know I had to do it twice and it's interesting isn't it so you know your mum's Thai stuffed omelette is your second food yes. moment but actually I wonder if you would use your least omelette oh, in uh, that. no <laughs> absolutely not no um too too buttery and rich it's it's quite a different beast actually and actually as a cook I I don't use as much oil at all I'm not big into oil but you have to use a certain amount so it doesn't stick so I've had to sort of compromise on what I'd normally use but definitely not as um not as rich um this is a really interesting dish. It's something my mum used to make when I was a kid. And um, actually, I found a, a journal of mine, um, I think I started it over 20 years ago, probably 23 years ago, um, to put recipes in it. And this was the first recipe I put in it. Um, this Thai stuffed omelette. It's an omelette with um, minced pork inside. It's got sort of tomatoes. It's actually really, the, really simple. It's tomatoes, vinegar and sugar and some onions and garlic. And it makes slightly sweet sour pork mint and it goes really well with an omelette. And it's not uh, very British in the slightest. I think people would probably think, oh, that sounds a bit strange. But when you taste it, it really, really works. Um, and I always wanted to include this in a book. And funny, I was speaking to my brother the other day and he said, oh, you put that omelette in the book. And I said, well, it's a bit late. The book's gone to print. But yes, I have put it in. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's um, a big part of the Thai cooking, isn't it? I mean, I've had plenty of th- omelettes in Thailand. Stuff, yeah, they love om- absolutely love eggs. Um, but having it with this pork mince is, you know, it's quite unusual. Mm. And it's not the sort of dish you would see in a restaurant. And part of my idea, I had sort of, I guess my concept was, it's not just about simple. It's also about dishes from 
you know, around sort of uh, parts of Asia that you won't see here. So I'm putting my spin on those dishes. Um, mm. It's not necessarily... This actually is more true to the to the original recipe. Um, although in my journal, um, I didn't... Of course, I didn't put any quantities. I just put onion, garlic, tomato, egg, you know. <laughs> uh, so I, over the years, I've had to sort of work out what on earth I meant. Um, and when my mum's here, I get her to taste it. And I was like, is this right? Oh, no, a bit more sugar. Oh, no, a bit more sour. Um, she's definitely taught me the importance of tasting as you go. Um, and, you know, how with Thai cuisine, it's got to be a bit salty, a bit sweet, a bit sour, a bit spicy, depending on the dish. So, oh, How lovely to have your mum on hand to do all that with you. Are you already doing that with your kids? Uh, oh, yes. Do you know what? I'm, I'm really lucky because they love their food and they are... They are pretty adventurous. Um, and probably when I say lucky, it's probably because I've forced it down. The, <laughs> you know, they've not had uh, much choice in the matter. Um, but they, I mean, the other day I made some smacked cucumbers, just a really chilli oil and some um, uh, rice vinegar, just a simple version of it. And my daughter, six-year-old, said, Mummy, can I try that? And I said, oh, no, no, you won't like it. It's too spicy. And mainly because I wanted to eat it. And she said, <laughs> I want it. And she basically took it and devoured it. And I had to replenish. So I gave her about half a cucumbers worth and it was so spicy she was saying mommy this is far too spicy but I can't help it I can't stop myself it's so good um and that is you know they love they love weird and wonderful things like prawns and mussels and they'll suck the heads out of seafood and all sorts (laughs) um yeah they 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 love it which is actually becomes a bit of a you know you think this is a grown this is my grown-up street and they've come in and and nicked your food so oh that's the good genes you see um leading nicely onto your third food moment your paternal Dutch grandmother, yes. Granny Wolf. Granny She's Wolf. brought up in Indonesia. And one of the things that, you know, we really must mention about the book is that it is Pan-Asian. Yes. Uh, there's, it's not just Thai at all. Yes. Was the Pan-Asian-ness of the book inspired by your own heritage? It's absolutely. I mean, obviously, starting off with, with um, Thai food is, is what I grew up with, but I was born in the Middle East. So I'm not saying there's Middle Eastern food in it, but I was just used to experiencing different foods from different cultures when I was young. Like one of the first restaurants I went to would have been an Indian restaurant because there was a big Indian community in Qatar where I lived. Um, but Asian, I mean, my mum doesn't just love Thai food. She loves Japanese food, Korean, all sorts, and uh, Malaysian food, of course. And she would have eaten a lot of that as, when she grew up in Bangkok. And, and of course, then I would have experienced that as as a child as well and they are there are similarities in ingredients and in types of dishes so I'm just naturally drawn to all of those types of um, foods yeah. um, and my grandmother she was brought up in Indonesia um, until she was sick until the war broke out and you know uh, it was um, she was unfortunately put into a camp um, as were her whole family so um, she hadn't been back since she was young but still still uh, loved the food and um, about 10 years ago I went with my brother and my dad and my grandmother for her last trip to Holland. So she was a native Dutcher, um, from the Netherlands anyway. Um, and um, she, we went to visit one of her old friends who she grew up with in Indonesia, but they hadn't seen each other for 30 years. So, you know, I think by this point, my grandmother was in her late 80s. And um, sadly, she had dementia. So she, you know, I, I shared a room with her. She was sort of OK, but didn't really know what was what. And her friend was so delighted to see her. It was really beautiful to see them reunited. Uh, but sad as well, because my grandmother didn't know what was going on. But she still loved the food. So we took, um, we all went out uh, for a celebratory. Uh, Indonesian meal in a local restaurant and there's, there are lots of Indonesian restaurants in Holland um, and uh, we had this feast, a ristafel um, and a ristafel is, is basically lots of small dishes and because there were so many of us we had about 30 on the table can you believe it um, and the one thing that I've always remembered from that feast was this surrounding um, out of all the dishes and I remember my brother and I, you know, it was in this little wooden bowl this kind of a toasted coconut very aromatic with spices and garlic and we literally fought for the last bit and we didn't know what to do with it. We just sprinkled it on our rice and our curries and we ate it. (laughs) Um, And after trying that, I thought, wow, I have to recreate this. Um, And it's so delicious. And you can make it without the chilli flakes so the children love it. Um, And it just works. It's just a a little garnish that makes all the difference. And 
you know, it doesn't take long to, to cook as well. So, yeah. yeah. Another one of those little cook hacks, you know, yeah. you, you you make it up in advance. You oh, yeah. In your kiln a jar, you just sprinkle it on things and it transforms a dish. Definitely. Brilliant. Um, you, you've you chosen for your fourth and final food moment, caramelised bananas. Yeah. And I'm surprised, and we will talk about those, but I'm surprised about those because I would have thought you'd do the miso pears because they did render the judges and the industry experts speechless. Yes, that's true. I mean, the, the, I'll, I'll quickly talk about the miso pears. I came up with this recipe a few years ago, or a version of it, um, and you know, they absolutely delicious. The judges loved them. Um, but the reason I chose the bananas is uh, because I first discovered them in Bangkok um, a few years ago. I think I was on my baby moon. I must have been. That was the last time I went there. Um, about seven, no, eight years ago, and. Um, I love street food. It's something that really excites me. And having kids now, I don't get to travel as much as I... Well, I don't get to travel to places like that at the moment. Um, hopefully that will change. But um, I just remember sort of seeing these street food stalls and, and I spotted them from a distance. And it was, wow, what's that? I was so excited to see these huge... There were sort of two skewers um, and they had sort of lots of bananas on each sort of double skewer. Um, and they were being barbecued and then they were being dipped in this vat of caramel. Oh and God. wow... For, for me as a foodie, I just, it, it, it was so exciting to see this. I, I made a beeline. I had to go and try them. And they sort of, um, they divvy them up. They take sort of a few off a few off at the time. They put it in a plastic bag and they cover it with more sauce. Um, and these bananas were starchy, very unusual, not like the ones we have here. Um, starchy. Um, so they hold their shape so they can skewer them. Um, and um, oh, it was it was fantastic. So it was a great experience. And, you know, it lived up to the kind of, I want to try street food and have an experience yeah. so it was it was a moment for me and I can smell those I can oh. absolutely smell them right now as you're yeah. talking about them in the in the streets and the steam coming off all the food oh, stalls and oh, absolutely heaven. so good very sticky very sweet oh. um, and and this version again it's a little hack actually um, it's it's literally boiling down coconut milk and sugar and it creates a syrup um, so easy um, and surprising because Again, it's not that common here, I don't think. And um, yeah, it makes a very simple dessert, but really delicious. Go on then, you've got to finish off by telling us about the miso pears. So again, this I don't make things like caramel. Actually, what you might do in your least course is a caramel. So I have made caramel, but for me, they are a bit faffy. Um, I can't be bothered to wait till sugar turns a different colour or whatever. Um, so this is a cheats version and, and it's so easy. It's literally mixing some milk with honey and the miso. So you mix that up and you put it into the pan with a bit of butter uh, and it sort of reduces down into this miso caramel, uh, cheats miso caramel, I will say. Um, and uh, you've, you've cooked the pears off before and uh, you can cut them into quarters to do them quickly. In the book, I've done them halves because they, they were prettier, but you can do either. Um, and that is a really tasty combination. And then I sort of elevated it by doing a crumble with it. Um, again, it, I love texture. Texture's great. And I do love a crumble topping. So, um, and with it, any leftover topping, you can use as a granola for other sort of things. Um, so for me, that's a great dessert. And I've got it. I do have a terrible sweet tooth, um, but I don't like, I'm not a pastry chef. I don't want to spend hours cooking a dessert. Absolutely not. So all my desserts are really quick, uh, just because that's the sort of thing I would naturally cook at home. Um, and yeah, these go down great. And if you're feeling uh, uh, like you need a treat at the weekend, it make a lovely breakfast as well. It's a wonderful time for you. It's great to be talking to you before the book comes out, you know, post the series and pre the book. Um, yeah. I mean, what are you most excited about at this stage? Oh, there is so much to look forward to. I, I feel for me, this is a different, excuse the pun, a different chapter. You know, I've, I've been, in a way, I've been working towards this for a long time. This has kind of been my, my goal, if you like. Um, and I'm really looking forward to everything that's going to come with it. It's, you know, the book is the start, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've got, um, you know, a number of food exhibitions lined up, which I'm really excited about as a consumer. I've always loved going to those things. Um, so I'm going to be do doing things like that. But there's a lot more to come, um, um, which, you know, I've just signed with an agency, a talent agency. So that's really exciting. Um, so I'm looking to see how my, yeah, it's a new phase of my career, basically. More telly? 
I'd love to do more TV. Um, so yes, I've started putting the feelers out for that. Um, it's giving me a taste, you know, for, for what it could be. So yeah, there's a lot more. I've already started thinking about book number two. Um, now when I'm making food, I'm trying to sort of cook slightly different, different combinations. So I've, I'm starting to sort of develop that, um, and starting to research as well. So I love the creation for me. Um, it, I just love being in the kitchen and creating something different. Um, and that's something that I, which is why I love writing recipes. So, um, something I'm continuing to do. Thanks for listening. You can read the transcripts to the show at juliesmith.com. Just click on podcasts. Do get in touch on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram, where you can follow my adventures in cookery with Lise online. Check the show notes and on Instagram for full details and follow the links to get Cooking the Books discounts on Lise's cookery courses. And I'll see you next week. Thank you.